I'm Alex Michelson. This week on The Issue Is, an exclusive one-on-one -on -one with the governor of California, Gavin Newsom, as he slams California counties on the issue of homelessness. Then, the first interview with California Senator Marie Alvarado Gill after she switches from the Democratic to the Republican Party. And a different view from progressive YouTuber Brian Tyler Cohen on his new book, arguing that Republicans are shameless. The Issue Is starts right now. Broadcasting across California, you're watching The Issue Is. Welcome to The Issue Is. I'm Alex Michelson. We begin this week with the issue of homelessness. The U.S. Supreme Court recently allowing local jurisdictions greater authority to remove homeless encampments. Now, after that ruling, California Governor Gavin Newsom signed an executive order vowing to clean up state lands and asking cities and counties to do the same. This week, we caught up with him while he was personally cleaning up state lands near the freeway in Mission Hills. He did it in L.A. County, where the Board of Supervisors recently passed a resolution saying the homeless should not be sent to L.A. County jails, a resolution the governor was not too fond of. What's the message out here today? Well, I don't know. The message is we continue uh, to struggle to clean this state up, period, full stop, to deal with health and safety, to deal with the number one complaint that's universal all been down the state, not just people who live here, uh, but people who visit here. And at a certain point, uh, people, you know, they're ready to turn the page on folks like me. They've had it. And I understand how much money we're spending. In fact, I think it's becoming more obnoxious the more we say we spend, and yet the results are not what they expect. And so, uh, look, I, I'm just, instead of preaching from Sacramento on my desk with a suit and tie, you, this is probably the fifth or sixth time we've done this together yeah. over the last few years. This is not a stunt. This is what I do consistently. But right now with that executive order, I hope people understand I'm, I'm done. And I'm not going to continue to make the investments, unprecedented historic investments from the state level, unless I see the results at the local level. You put out an executive order getting encampments off of state ground, but strongly suggesting to cities and counties that they do their part. Are you satisfied with what cities and counties are doing? Because a place like L.A. City, L.A. County, kind of pushing back on what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, I, cities, I've, I've, I've been pretty impressed. Counties, no. Uh, counties have been, you know, there's a diffuse nature of leadership in a county. You have multiple members of boards of supervisors, mayor, there's one person accountable. I think Mayor Bass has done a wonderful job. She's been a great partner. You're seeing that down 10.4%, over 10% decline in unsheltered homeless population last year. So that's progress. But I'm not seeing that at the county level. And with all due respect, there's no more excuses. Everything the cities and counties have asked for, the state of California has delivered, and the Supreme Court just delivered. So there's no more excuses. So where's the urgency? Drop everything else. Get out there and address the number one, two, and three issue in this state with an intensity of purpose. That's the kind of action I want to see. And again, for me, if we don't see it, it's not complicated. We're not going to continue to make the investments in communities that aren't willing to do their part. I will redirect those dollars to counties and cities that are doing their part. And so, so what that's that, clear. What does that look like exactly? L.A. County, the biggest county in the state. One out of four people live in L.A. County. Yeah. And a lot of the county leaders are pushing back on this. So what does that mean for this place? Well, I, it, I mean, L.A. County can right now move forward with our conservatorship law. They refuse to do it. L.A. County right now could significantly increase the number of people getting support under the care court. Unprecedented support into the county. Billions and billions of dollars over the last few years. Um, and yet we're seeing the same excuses I've seen for decades. And again, it's not an indictment. These are my, I say this sincerely, like this is not a fake political thing. Actually, my friends, mm -hmm. this is not an indictment of them. It's, it's an institutional construct where people are acting as like they're victims. And they've been using every excuse in the, in the toolkit. I'm just done. Drop everything else. Get out there and address the number one issue in, the state, in, this, in this county, in this region. And across the state, again, it's not just about L.A. County. But to put out a resolution right after I did an executive order, uh, you better believe I paid attention to that. And I'll be paying attention to that in January, and I'll be paying attention to that every single week in between now and January, because I want to see results. People deserve results. People deserve to get off the streets and sidewalks. There's nothing about this as humane. Nothing about this is healthy. People are dying on their watch. They're dying on their watch. There's nothing compassionate about this. And what do you say to people that we spent $24 billion on homelessness and the problem's gotten worse? I know you're frustrated by that, but what do you say to residents who have, have had enough as well and well, don't trust the state? Exactly. Well, the state is doing work it's never done in its history. 
This is not the state's role and responsibility. It never has been its history. It's the county function. As a former county mayor, I intimately understand that. I never looked to Arnold Schwarzenegger to fix it, and we never looked at the state. I recognize the state needs to do more, and we've done just what the cities and counties have asked for. So all I say is we want to see results. I share that frustration. I want to see results. I want to physically see the streets cleaned up. I want to see encampments removed. I want to see it done compassionately. We're not criminalizing poverty, just the opposite. But what is criminal is the neglect. You can't square the rhetoric of compassion with the reality of the feces and the urine and the needles and the fact that people don't have a place to go to the restroom, let alone to get a warm meal. And uh, on, on, in terms of uh, the national politics, news today that Donald Trump is uh, is agreeing to a debate with her. What would, what would your strategy be or advice in terms of debating Trump and your thoughts on Tim Wall? Well, I, I, I think Kamala will clean his clock. And I think it's pretty clear um, that he's looking at the clock and he's panicking. And that press conference was just about panic. Uh, he knows he's starting to lose. Momentum's completely shifted. His rhetoric is becoming increasingly stale. Uh, he's, he's on the ropes. Uh, just a week ago, said, I will never debate on ABC. Now he says, well, I'll do ABC, NBC, and Fox. Uh, you know, it's just the guy's all over the place. He's got to, he's got to regret his vice presidential choice. Um, and Kamala Harris got a great vice president choice. And so uh, I, uh, I worry about how unhinged he can get over the course of the last, next few months. And I'm just grateful he's not the president of the United States, just a candidate. Just real quickly, Panda. It was Panda Day. We were just at San Diego at the National Zoo. We were in China helping to negotiate this sort of thing. Thank you. What, did it, what, did, what yeah. did it mean to you to see the pandas? Well, the, it's, I, as I said at the press conference today, it wasn't about the pandas. It was about what the pandas represent. If we can save the pandas, maybe we can save ourselves. Uh, if we can reconcile our differences as it relates to helping each other on biodiversity loss on the climate, maybe we can also address uh, the friction and all the stress that we're feeling between our two nations. I said it again, you heard me say it in China, divorce is not an option. And we just have to define the terms of our strategic red lines and our engagement moving forward. But at the end of the day, it's people to people and it's about respect and understanding. It's about capacity uh, to learn from one another. It's about cultural exchanges. And to me today represented that. Great to see you, Governor. We'll see you in Chicago at the DNC. See you in Chicago. You don't want to shake my hand, yeah. so I'll just take a pistol. <laughs> All right. Up next, the California senator who switched from Democrat to Republican. Her first interview with us. Now to an issue is exclusive. This week, California State Senator Marie Alvarado Gill switched parties. She's going from the Democratic majority to the Republican minority. With her move, there are now 31 Democrats in California State Senate and nine Republicans. That means Democrats do retain their supermajority. Here's a look at her district. It includes the Sierra and Central Valley. For years, this district has mostly voted for Republicans, but supported Alvarado Gill as a Democrat when she ran in 2022. Senator Marie Alvarado Gill is here with us on The Issue Is for her first interview right. since making the switch. Thanks so much for being here. Of course, thanks for having me. So why switch from Democrat to Republican? <laughs> well, first and foremost, it was the right thing to do. I've been a Democrat my whole adult life, my first vote as an 18 year old new voter was as a Democrat. And I'll just tell you, Alec, the Democratic Party of today is not the Democratic Party that I signed up with. So what was the moment where you decided, I can't do this anymore, right. I need to be a Republican? That's right. So the reality is this. In California, we have seen the pendulum swing so far in the areas of crime, homelessness, and for so long in public education. The supermajority has the power in both the executive branch and the legislature. But what I'm missing is that will to change, that will to ensure that Californians across our state are taken care of. You know, uh, there clearly are many of your constituents who voted for you as a Democrat. They're right. expecting you to serve out your term as a Democrat. Right. What do you say to them? Um, I've been listening to them for the past two years, serving uh, my district that is predominantly a Republican district. Now, for me, I came in as a beneficiary of the open primaries. So this was a seat that has not been held by a Democrat in over 30 years. And in the general, it was a Democrat on Democrat race. Now, I came in as a moderate. I've always held moderate values. And I've swung a little bit moderate right. So now seeing how the inner workings of the majority party work in Sacramento, 
I have to step back and say, is this good not only for my constituents, but is this good for Californians? And my answer is no. You had to talk to the Democrats about this. I so did. Mike McGuire is the leader for the Democrats. He's the right. Senate president pro tem. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have a statement from him in terms of his response. He says, quote, this is disappointing to voters who elected Senator Alvarado Gill as a Democrat. They trusted her to represent them. And then she betrayed that trust. Senate Democrats continue to work on their behalf and deliver results for rural California. Can you take us inside the room? Right. What was it like when you told Senator McGuire, I'm leaving the party? Right, so you know, this, this for me is, uh, it was a personal decision and I took that personal decision uh, to the pro tem and whether that means that I would get pulled off committees, as you know, I'm uh, chair of human services, um, more than likely come Monday, I will not have that position. Um, there may be some other repercussions. We know that there is a, a punitive element to leaving the supermajority. But I'll tell you, I have a lot of respect for Senator uh, McGuire, for Pro Tem McGuire, and understand that you know he may be disappointed, but the sense of betrayal, that's where I disagree. Um, have any of your other Democratic colleagues thought to do something similar? Yeah. <laughs> well, um, you know, I'm not gonna speak for them, but I'll tell you, there are Democrats that think the way that I do. Um, either moderate or center-leaning Democrats. And there may be some decisions that they need to make in terms of their own values and the direction that they see California going. So you're not on the ballot this year. You're next up in 2026. Are That's you right. going to run for re-election as a Republican? I am going to stay a Republican um, until I am put in the ground. <laughs> <laughs> I am committed to this. Um, you know, I, I talked to my husband about this last week and he says, you know, I've never been married to a Republican. And so I said, and you're never going to be divorced from a Republican either. So, you know, we have some fun with it. But, you know, the reality of this, Alec, is this is a commitment. And I'm just excited to kick this off. Uh, Harris versus Trump. Who are you supporting? Well, you know, that's the question of the day, right? So for me, I'm going to be watching both of our candidates very closely between now and the election. And for me, I'm really looking at someone who can embrace the diversity of our country and lead us into the next generation. Oh, we know so much about both of them. Who, who is that at this point? <laughs> well, you got to see what I have on the ballot. I'll see you in November. We can have well, we that know conversation. we on the ballot. It's going to be, be Harris versus we'll, Trump. We'll, we'll see, we'll see which, which box I mark, although, but I'll be back to talk to although, you about although that. Although we don't know who, we don't know maybe what will be on the ballot because we thought it was going to be Biden versus Trump. Yeah, so thanks. I'll tell you, we don't to know. Your, things to your, change. To your point, yeah. things change. We thought you were a Democrat that's last right. week. So things you never change. know. I guess that's, that's true. All right, we're going to end with something fun. Here Good. on the show, we play something called Personal Issues. All right. This is 30 seconds to get to know you your cultural favorites, okay. uh, first thing that comes to mind. Right. Uh, here we go. Uh, what is your favorite TV show? TV show, um, Big Bang Theory. Favorite movie? Movie, The Godfather. Favorite musical artist? A musical artist. You know, I like musicals, so when you said that, the sound of music came to mind for me, but that's not an artist, Okay, we'll right? go with Julie Andrews. Okay, there favorite we go. Favorite sports team? Oh, you know, Gosh, Bay Area fans are going to come at me, but I'm a Raiders fan, and I'm sorry they left California, but everyone's leaving California. Yep, yep. Well, not everybody. <laughs> uh, who is your and who is your role model? Uh, my role model is my grandmother. Why is that? My grandmother raised me. Um, I was uh, very young when I was separated from my parents, and she took me in, and she um, introduced me to community, um, to the church, and she also taught me what it meant to be a very strong entrepreneurial woman. What do you think she would think of you becoming a Republican? Oh, she would say, ay, mija, estoy muy orgullosa de ti. She would say, you know, my, my daughter, my hija, I'm very proud of you. All right, Senator, we'll leave it yeah. there. Thank you so much. Thank Great you. talking with us. Thank you. We'll have a different view from the Democratic perspective when we come back. You're watching right. The Issue Is. I think he's a kook. He's not fit to be president of the United States. He's a jackass. Yeah, I like the president. Well, that Lincoln Project ad featured in the new book, Shameless, Republicans' Deliberate Dysfunction and the Battle to Preserve Democracy. It's by Brian Tyler Cohen. Brian is a progressive YouTuber whose videos have been seen literally by billions. He is the host of the No Lie with Brian Tyler Cohen podcast. Brian Tyler Cohen, welcome back to The Issue Is. Always great to be here. Thanks for having me. And just for full disclosure to people, I met you through this show, and you have become one of my best friends. It's true. And we are so proud of you for this book. Oh, Congratulations. Thanks. It's great and so excited for Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, this was the first show that I was on, and uh, and that's that's thanks to you. So I'm really glad. Uh, I'm grateful for, for being here, but also your friendship. So. so 
Talk to people, what is shameless? What's the basic point? The basic point is that for so long, Republicans have operated under this guise of pretending that they were some, that pretending that they are something that they are very clearly not. And so there are a lot of branding points that they use, the, that they're pro-constitution, pro-family values, pro-states rights, pro-fiscal responsibility, pro-law and order. And what I try to do with the book is prove that that is expressly not the case. And in fact, they're relying on this branding to give them cover to behave in a way that's completely antithetical to that branding itself. And in large part, the media has helped them perpetuate this farce. And then finally, what Democrats can do to rebalance the political landscape moving forward. But in terms of communicating, you say there are a lot of lessons that Democrats can learn from Donald Trump's effectiveness. Yes. What are some of those lessons? And this is not to give too much praise to, uh, to Donald <laughs> Trump here, but look, he's been very effective in terms of wielding, wielding repetition, for example, wielding simple messages. I mean, how many times have we heard, build the wall, lock her up, make America great again, beat over our heads over and over and over till it's seared into our cerebral cortexes, right? <laughs> and so I think what we're seeing now is finally Democrats recognizing the power of repetition and the power of simple messages that can actually resonate with people. We're not going back is one of them that Kamala Harris has used over and over again. It's simple, it's to the point, it's evocative, and, uh, and, and it's sticking. And, and I'm glad the Democrats are finally learning that lesson. Well, because you interview Al Franken in the book, and yeah. he talks about sometimes the problem for the Democrats' bumper stickers are they need to say, continue on next bumper sticker. Right. <laughs> Basically, right. that the message is so complicated and so long that nobody can remember it. You are seeing this, uh, we're not going back from Kamala Harris. You also see this word weird that's being used a lot, started by Tim Walls, who was chosen this week as the running mate. Uh, how is that connecting? Talk about what you're seeing online, because you look at the metrics online closer than anybody every single day. What's connecting in the Democratic base right now? Well, there's two things. One is the fact that what we are seeing is weird. If somebody is so obsessed over what you do in your bedroom, if somebody's so obsessed over what you do in your doctor's office, if someone's so obsessed over what you read, what you learn in school, what bathroom you're walking into, that is weird. We would call it weird in our normal lives. If somebody, if somebody said that they were doing that uh, on an individual basis, basis. So yeah, it's weird. And I'm glad that it's that it's finally sticking. And to Democrats credit to the left's credit, we finally do have an ecosystem that is a little bit more organized and we're able to combat what's happening on the right. Uh, what's also resonating is this idea that there's just hope right now in Democratic politics. And that's what we're seeing with Kamala Harris and Tim Walls. And uh, for, for once, it's not just it's not it's it's hard to do to do the gloom and doom thing every single day and, and to try to get people excited to come out and vote as opposed to just staying at home when the message over and over is that we have to protect our democracy from its imminent demise. And so Kamala Harris has been able to wield this message of hope and what could be in the future. And I think uh, I think that a lot of it's bringing a lot of people into the political process. Yeah, well, your name uh, is right here on Shameless, <laughs> but you also have different names of people that you've interviewed, most of whom have written books before yes. uh, that have been on your show, no lie. So this book is broken down with a lot of these players in it. So to promote who you talk to, I thought it would be fun to play the name game, okay. uh, which is where we put up the name of somebody. And these are all people you talk to in the book and the first word that comes to mind when you think of them, okay? okay? Yep. So the first one is Congressman Jamie Raskin. Oh, he is, uh, he is a hero. Attorney Mark Elias. He is, he's an attack dog and uh, yeah, he's an attack dog. Uh, former Senator Al Franken. Hilarious. Uh, commentator Mehdi Hassan. Oh, a fighter, thank God. Pod Save America host Dan Pfeiffer. Always right. <laughs> uh, former White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki. Jen Psaki, the, the best press secretary we've ever had. Professor Heather Cox Richardson. Oh, brilliant, brilliant, and truth teller. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg. Pete is a rhetorical assassin. <laughs> okay, and finally, your mom. One word that comes to mind for your mom. Well, actually, and I talk about this in the book, but a voter, and, uh, uh, and that, that means a lot. My mom hadn't voted in 60 years, and I got a, a surprise text one morning during the 2020 election that showed her casting a ballot for Democrats. Wow, 
I, so you couldn't convince her before that? I convinced, I convinced <laughs> thousands of people yes. way before I, way lo long after I so, gave up on so, trying to convince So what mother. do you think is the winning message for your mom and other people to convince them to actually get out there and do it? It is that, it is that we have agency and there is a reason that certain Republicans are trying so hard to prevent people from voting or to make you believe that you don't have agency and that is because they know how much power each individual person has. I mean, these elections are won not by millions of people, not by hundreds of thousands, but tens of thousands, or in some case, just thousands of people. And so please, for everybody watching, make sure that you have a plan to vote, make sure that you're registered, and make sure that you have somebody in your life who wouldn't have otherwise gone and voted and that they have a plan to vote as well. All right, Brian, congratulations Thanks. again. We're Thank so you proud so of you. Love you, brother. Uh, we go to break with George Michael's freedom, uh, which is a big theme these days, especially for the Democratic Party. <laughs> there you go. We'll be right back. More of the issue is after this, including Adam Schiff. Next week, Speaker Emerita Nancy Pelosi with us here in studio one on one for the half hour. This week, we caught up with a Pelosi favorite, Congressman Adam Schiff. You can watch that full interview right now at youtube.com slash Alex Michelson. One of the topics we discussed was Schiff's recent appearance on a Zoom called White Dudes for Harris, which raised over four million dollars. We end this week with the congressman talking about his favorite guest on that show. We had the dude on that Zoom. I'm the dude. That is Jeff Bridges, the Big Lebowski. What was it like for you to be on that call with him? Oh, it was it was terrific. It was such a great surprise. And Alex, you'll forgive me if I told you the story already, but I was in the Oval Office about two months ago for a bill signing with President Biden. And when the signing was done, he quoted some movie, which I didn't recognize the reference. And he told me he likes to quote movies and often his staff doesn't recognize the reference. And I said, I do the same thing. But I said, Mr. President, I want to quote a movie in the Oval Office and make Lebowski history. When I say, looking at that beautiful oval rug in the Oval Office, Mr. President, this rug really ties the whole room together. <laughs> did, did he get it? <laughs> Has Joe Biden no, he's seen the big he's Lebowski before? <laughs> he certainly laughed, whether he understood the reference <laughs> uh, whether he's a, a big Lebowski fan or not, I cannot speak to, but he did crack up. <laughs> uh, Congressman Schiff, great to see you. Thanks so much for coming on. Great to see you. This rug I have, it really tied the room together.